been almost 10 years since John uh, died early. And uh, it's a tribute to his lasting legacy that we're all here tonight. I mean, we're out here because Lisa wrote a book, but I think we're out here also because of what uh, John did to us, all those who, who knew him, he influenced in some way, and uh, we remember him. Uh, we remember him as a explorer and uh, a very unique individual in terms of his ability to survive and be resilient in the mountains. But in his later years, uh, we remember him as a, uh, a conservationist. And he, uh, around 1995, after uh, his friend Randy Stoltman was killed, really got into the environmental movement and began a unique program. He would bring people up into the upper reaches of the Ilaho and the uh, Lillooet River and uh, people, city people, and let them experience uh, what it was like in the wilderness. And that was also uh, where industrial logging was going on. And in that time, he joined up with two other individuals, Chief Bill, who you've already met, and Nancy Black, who's a photographer and artist, and together they founded the, the Witness Program, uh, which was a very unique program uh, to get people in touch with, with the land. And the next speaker then is Nancy Black, who's going to show us some images and tell us how that all got started. So, Nancy. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Coast Salish peoples whose land we're on and for the beautiful opening ceremony by the Squamish Nation led by Chief Bill Williams. Um, it's an honor for me to be here tonight to share with you some images and some words. And most of the images I'll be sharing are my own, but within the mix, there are also images by Shell Neufeld, who's here tonight, by Guy Warrington, uh, Randy Stoltman, and um, I believe that's it. Yeah. And I just wanted to um, start by saying that John Clark was a great man, and we all know this, but to those who knew him, um, he touched us so deeply. But for those who didn't know him, you benefit today from his accomplishments and his generous heart by enjoying some of the places that he worked so hard to, uh, to safeguard. And John entered my life in 1995, um, where he gave an outdoor slideshow in the Ilaho Valley by way of a generator, in a clear cut, <laughs> to a group of about 100 people. And you could see how he stood out from a crowd. He, um, you know, not simply because of his white hair, but by the way he rolled with people, his bouncy energy, his sparkling nature, uh, he was special even from a distance, and you could see that. But it wasn't until the next day, after everyone went home and evening came, that a small group of about five people huddled around a fire, brainstorming about what to do next, that, that I got to see John up close. A humble man with a determined mind. So connected to the natural world of the Coast Mountains that he felt more at home there than anywhere else on Earth. And I was one of those people, along with John, that shared a desire to take the next step to do something, anything, um, to stop the logging of ancient rainforests. And he told me that, um, that we had about 10 or 15 years, and that's it. And after that time, it's just too late. And so what we do today really, really matters. So we joined efforts the following weekend in the upper Lillooet Valley, and for the next seven years, practically almost every weekend in the summer, I got to know John on levels that are rare and privy, only to those who experience the intimacy of friendship that happens in outdoor spaces, over time, and especially on lands as powerful as those of Sims Creek and the Ilaho Valley, known as Nukhayansut, 
which means place of transformation. Early in our friendship, John took me to the Mount Equipment Co-op for gear, because I'm a girl from the suburbs and don't know much about wilderness camping. I had no idea at the time that this man was well known in the mountaineering community. And while in the store, someone approached John and asked for his autograph. And I watched John turn beet red and he quickly responded with, oh, no, 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 you must be mistaking me with my brother, Norm. <laughs> and he <laughs> whisked me away. John, he was a man who did not seek attention. Rather, his energy came from the pure pleasure of the process. And he always said, it's not simply getting to the peaks that keep a climber from coming back but it's what happens to you on the 21st day of being in the mountains that keeps me returning year after year after year. And that's not something one can easily share with words because you just have to experience it. I believe John connected to a quality of life in the mountains that was very specific and that very few people ever, ever really get to know. So you can imagine what it would have taken to bring him down from the mountains he loved so much and into the valleys to switch from being a mountaineer and to becoming the center of attention within the Witness family, to catering to the needs of hundreds of amateur outdoors people hungry for an authentic experience in the wilderness, myself among those people, and to become a wilderness educator and conservationist. He did this with care and with love and with generosity for people and for the land. He did it unselfishly with joy, and especially for the kids. Two things stand out for me in my time with John, and one of them is buckets, and lots of them. Now, many of you won't know what I'm talking about, but John would say this, you couldn't pay me to do this job. And he would say it as we poured buckets of human waste into a little hole at Alice Lake designed for trailers. And that's, of course, after carting those same buckets for one and a half hour in our car down the logging road, bumping and swishing along on the ride. This was our idea of leaving no traces in the woods, while accommodating hundreds of people at Sims Creek every weekend in the very early stages of bringing people up to the land to see and hear for themselves. I repeat, you couldn't pay me to do this job, he would say, time and again, and that's because John was never motivated by a money culture, but by natural currency, and by his relationship with people and with the world. Another thing that stands out for me is Fort Cupper. <laughs> the one time I traversed a glacier with John over nine days was nothing short of miraculous. I came home from that trip completely unhinged, but in a good way, and continued to eat meals out of my Fort Cupper for several weeks afterwards. And I never saw the mountains the same way again. And even today, when I look at the North Shore from my kitchen window, I see a place called home. Another thing quite simple that I will always cherish are the days when I would return home from art school as a student to find John cooking his famous potato stew on my stove. John was a real friend, someone who offered up those simple gestures of kindness on the everyday. When we joined efforts with hereditary chief Bill Williams of the Squamish Nation, Palau Sumkainsiyam, John and I became opened up to a whole new way of experiencing the land, culturally that is. John was not only a teacher for us, for so many of us, but he was also a very good student in learning new ways of seeing, hearing, thinking, and feeling the world, Coast Salish style. He never lost that sense of curiosity, of humility, of being the child. John was at the heart of the Hutsam Witness family. His energy and his sharp focus attracted so many people to join us, over 10,000 people in 10 years. And in the process, he transformed our understanding of wilderness as simply home, not as a place out there separate from ourselves to be feared, but kind of like a way to return back to ourselves, step by step, one weekend at a time. He brought us along on a journey that was unforgettable, and it changed us. He called witness magic, and if anyone knew what that meant, he did. 
John was witness to some of the most amazing places on the coast and had more than a mere acquaintances uh, with magical experiences in the mountains. This miraculous coming together of people to create change was inspirational and exceptional. The magic ingredient John describes of witness was this amazing coming together of people through ceremony on the land. And everyone felt it. And that's why we all kept coming back year after year after year. Just like John kept going back to the mountains year after year. Not for money or for fame or any other selfish motive, but for the love of it, for the pleasure of the process, and for what happens to you after the 21st ceremony out on the land. <laughs> Meaningful change takes time. I have a few quotes to share, and the first one is from John. And I quote, For a million years or more, we humans lived outside, under the sun and the stars, our lives guided by the seasons, the weather and the tides. For all this time, we were a community of plants and animals, where day-to-day -day living Landscape and spirituality were intertwined. The witness camping begins reconnect us, however briefly, with that world. When we drink from the cold mountain streams or sit around the fire at night, we are coming home to that place from which we all evolved. And another one of my favorite quotes is by Aaron Nelson Moody, who said, We write not on paper or stone, but on the hearts of those who come. And this book may be written on paper, but it was first written on the land. <laughs> and also, in Lisa's heart. And in closing, I would like to say thank you to Lisa for this extraordinary book and for your unstoppable pursuit in bringing us John's stories. Right.